Thanks, everyone. So we're going to kick this off with a cautionary tale. Today, I'm going to be talking about experience mapping. Um, so about a year ago, my friend Jeff was in the market for a new car. And as you might expect, he starts his search out on the internet. Um, he looks at a few different automaker sites, uh, but he lands on one automaker site in particular. Now, I'm not going to name any names. So for the purposes of this, uh, you know, conference today, I'm going to be using a company that's completely fake, doesn't bear any resemblance to a real company whatsoever. <laughs> Fjord.com. Go further. So, um, Jeff finds himself on the Fjord.com website, and Jeff is a, is a definitely a truck guy. Um, he's looking to build out the most badass truck you've ever seen. And nothing says badass like the Ford Super Duty, a name which, when I hear it, I think of something completely different than a truck, <laughs> but that's sort of beside the point. Um, so Jeff's on the site, and he sees this build your own option right here, which is uh, very intriguing to him, so he clicks on that. And it brings him to this really nice, customizable experience where he can truly build out the, the Ford Super Duty that he wants. So he's obviously going to pick the uh, F450, because that's the biggest number. Um, <laughs> he can't forget about the torque shift six speed automatic transmission with selection with 6.7 liter power stroke V8 diesel, diesel engine because how could you live without that? Um, and last, we might as well even throw some rocket boosters on there <laughs> for good measure. So, Jeff spends about 30 minutes truly customizing the car or the truck that he wants, right? He's, he's invested a lot of time in this. And the kicker is he finds this button on the website that basically offers to find his truck for him. So he's thinking, oh, this truck might actually exist. Let me click this button. He fills out the info. And just a few moments later, he, his phone rings. He gets a call from a Fjord.com sales rep. But this is where everything went completely wrong. Guess what the first thing that the Fjord.com sales rep says to Jeff. Why don't you tell me what kind of vehicle you're looking for today? So Jeff spent all this time creating his dream truck and the sales rep knew absolutely nothing about it. So what went wrong here? Now I've, I've never worked with Fjord.com because it's not real, um, but I have worked with a lot of companies who you know, see similar problems to this. And if I were to venture a guess, I would say there's probably two teams at Fjord.com, a web team and a sales team, or you know, something similar. The web team is focused on certain things, like getting people to click that Find My Ford button. Meanwhile, the sales team is focused on let's sell as many of these badass trucks as possible. But these two teams have run into a classic problem. They never talk to each other. They're completely siloed. So imagine if instead of doing it that way, these teams got together and created a map of Jeff's experience, like this. They would know um, what Jeff was doing as he went through this process. So that's that first row up there. They would know what he was thinking when he received that phone call from the Fjord.com sales rep. And they would understand that he was feeling pretty angry and frustrated when he got that call. Immediately, everyone knows why they lost Jeff's business. So. From this example, we can see why experience mapping can be incredibly beneficial to companies, organizations. Um, it breaks down these silos, these walls, which is why I used to find myself continuously perplexed. Why don't more companies do experience mapping? Well, the answer to that is actually really simple. Experience mapping is really hard to do. And I found that out the hard way. Um, when I first started doing these sessions, I sucked at it. I was really bad. Uh, so for example, the first experience mapping session that I ever did, I was in a room with some clients, and I essentially threw an example experience map up on a projector screen, and I said, all right, everyone, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make that thing, except for your business. And that was not enough direction. Um, it did not go very well. That's one of the biggest challenges with these experience maps. They're packed full of data. Going from a blank canvas to a full uh, you know, informative experience map 
is intimidating, not just for me as a facilitator, but for the people in the room. They look at that and they're like, how are we ever going to get to that? So uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. I, <laughs> I kind of forgot about this part. I might as well have asked them to try to recreate like a one-of-a-kind unique painting, you know, can't be found anywhere else in the world, um, and we all know how that goes. So, um, experience mapping is intimidating, but this is not the only challenge, right? These things are very time intensive to create. They require a lot of um, collaboration across different business units or teams within your organization. Uh, they can sometimes be all day long sessions. And so because of that, they're a scheduling nightmare. Um, the other big thing, and probably the most common problem that I see with experience mapping, is that teams create them without any actual reliable data, based completely on assumptions, and guesses, or approximations, not actual research data. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. How can we tackle some of these challenges and make experience mapping a more attainable goal? So first, let's talk about two different approaches that I've actually used to do experience mapping sessions. The first approach is definitely a more traditional approach where um, you do all of your ethnographic research ahead of time. You bring your research notes into the session with you, with your colleagues. You kind of comb through it, pick out bits and pieces, and get them up on a wall in experience map form. I'm not going to be talking about this way today. I'm going to be talking about it a different way. But this way uh, of doing it is it gives you very reliable information. The problem is that it takes a lot of time. We've already talked about how much time it takes just to do the mapping session itself. Doing the research is even more time on top of that. Plus, we all know that trying to convince leadership to give you the time and budget to do user research is sometimes like pulling an alligator's teeth. So let's talk about our second option. I call this co-creation. In the second option, we essentially fast track everything by skipping that first research uh, step and bringing our end users into the actual session with us to help us complete this experience map. So we get to hear about what they did, what they were feeling, um, what they were thinking throughout the entire process firsthand. Now, this approach isn't without its pros and cons, right? It is faster, but the main criticism that you're going to hear about this methodology is that what people say they do is not always the same as what people actually do. And I'm sure many of you have encountered this before. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about how we can mitigate that bias um, to a certain extent during these sessions. So um, that being said, I want to stress that I think you know, some customer interaction is better than zero customer interaction when you're doing a project, right? If it's between you, know, you can't get the budget, you can't get the time to go out and do the ethnographic research, this is a great way to still get some input from your customers and get reliable data up onto your experience map. So with that being said, um, we're actually going to be doing some live experience mapping here today. You might have mentioned the uh, makeshift whiteboard that we've created over here on the right. Apologies to the people in the top right who probably can't see it very much. Um, but we're going to be narrating as we go along, so you'll be able to follow along. Uh, and I've got my colleague John here who's going to be helping me out today as well. Uh, he's kind of my guinea pig participant. And we're actually going to be looking at the, the experience of in-store grocery shopping, which is something that everyone here should be familiar with because we all need to eat food to not die. <laughs> so uh, with no further ado, I'm going to put on my facilitator hat, and we're going to jump into this. And we're going to start first with the doing row. And hopefully this works. Oh, it sounds like it. OK, cool. All right. So um, step number one, well, first, let me talk about this. We're going to break this down into six tiny steps because, again, doing these things is super intimidating, right? And we're going to be using two facilitation techniques throughout, individual brainstorming and fill in the blanks. And I'll explain why here in a second. OK, so first step of the process, um, facilitator hat on. OK, John, so I would like for you to think about the last time that you went grocery store shopping. I'd like you to write each step that you took down on a post-it note. And so to make things super simple, all you have to do is complete this sentence. The last time I went grocery store shopping, I blank. Make sense? OK. And, and real fast, we'll go through an example. So the last time that I went grocery store shopping, 
I made a shopping list. That was one of the things that I did. Straightforward, got it? Okay, cool. So I'm gonna set a timer for two minutes. Um, don't worry too much about the time. If we need more time at the end, we can always add more time. Okay, so you can go ahead and get started and I will start that timer. So while John is brainstorming, let's talk about what I just said. Let's break that down. So first, notice how I didn't ask John to tell me what he typically does when he goes to the grocery store. If you ask people to tell you what they typically do, they're gonna give you very vague answers. Um, you're not gonna get reliable data. This brings it back to the fact that what people say they do is not always the same as what they actually do. So by asking the question in this way, we make them ground everything in reality in a specific time that they went grocery store shopping. Now, on the note of recruiting participants, you probably wanna find people who have recently gone grocery store shopping in this example, right? So um, this is important to ask it this way. The next thing, the fill in the blank example. So even in this first tiny step, I've already given John a lot of instructions. Uh, in, in my experience, you know, participants aren't always paying attention. They may just not understand the instructions. The fill in the blank example gives them a constant reference that they can look back at um, in case they do get lost or they forget what they're supposed to be doing. You know, I've had people during this step of the session um, just start writing down a list of features that they want or a list of complaints before I actually did it this way. So this makes sure you're getting that good, reliable, plain language feedback that you need in the format that you need. Talk about all that. And last, we have this disclaimer about the time. So if you don't do this time disclaimer, people are gonna feel really rushed. They're gonna be scrawling notes as fast as they can, and you're gonna end up with notes that look like hieroglyphics drawn over a wall. Like, this is a real picture, uh, and I can't read any of this stuff. <laughs> GMO nine squiggle, I don't know. <laughs> and lastly, on the, on the time limit, um, we're doing two minutes here today because we are strapped for time. In a real session, and there's my timer, in a real session, you would probably want to do this for five to 10 minutes uh, a piece, and then again, you can always add more time at the end if you need to. All right, so with that, I'm going to pass it off to, oh wait, no, I'm not. Sorry, there's one more. Is this thing working? You hear me? Good. It's working? Okay. Sounds good. So uh, we'll do that in a second. So I mentioned that there's six different steps. We just did the first step. The second step, uh, John has actually done ahead of time, again, because we're strapped for time here today. But I am gonna talk to how you would facilitate this step. Um, so the second step is to list channels. If you think back to the example with Jeff, right, his experience kind of went to crap when he switched from web to face-to-face -face interaction, two different channels, right? So that's why these channels are important. So all you need to say to your participants is, okay, um, I'd like for you to read back through the tasks that you just brainstormed silently to yourself. And then for each task, I'd like you to write down the tool or the medium that you used to complete the task. And it's a good idea here to give them some examples like I have over here on the right. So two steps down. Uh, the next step we're actually gonna do here live. Uh, we're gonna ask John to present and order these tasks on the board. So here's what facilitator hat back on. Okay, John, I would like for you to read through the tasks that you wrote down. And as you read them out loud, I'd like you to place them on the map in the doing row chronologically in the order that they happened. All right. Uh, so step one here, I realized that we actually needed to go shopping. Good first step. Um, Sorry, are we covering channels right now? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, second step, made a shopping list. I, uh, we, in my family, like to make two shopping lists based on which store we like to go to. So kind of made a list of, uh, for each store. Step Actually, three. John, I'm going to interrupt if you yep. don't mind reading the channels out. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, so realize we needed food. That's just looking at the fridge, you know, kind of physical world interacting there. I uh, made a shopping list. I like to use Apple Notes on my phone because I can share that uh, with my wife. She likes to add things and take things out of the list. Uh, as you know, is appropriate. Um, usually junk food. Um, drove to Wegmans in our car. Oh, 
Wegmans being a grocery store. I don't know if everybody has that. but uh, Walk through the aisles in the usual order. So we always go through the store in the same order each time. We kind of have like a really set path that we follow. Um, so just kind of following that pattern. And then grabbing items. Um, so, you know, looking through the aisles, getting what we need. Um, that's kind of a, I'll borrow that from you. This, these two things, um, you know, we, we walk through and we, we get things. So these things kind of happen, um, you know, as a cycle, just kind of grabbing things as we go through the store. Uh, then we had realized that we forgot to add my daughter's lunch, um, the meat that she likes to have, ham and her lunch. So at that point, we realized we forgot to put that on the list in the first place. So we backtracked to the deli, looking at the signs in the store to find kind of where that is. Then, if I can get these apart. Whoops. Yeah. Uh, so wandered around looking for a ranch dip packet. We can never find this damn packet in the store. Um, every single time, even though we've been there probably 100 times. So again, looking at signs, trying to decipher where that pa packet actually is. Found it, so we checked out. Uh, at this point, had an argument with my daughter about the candy in the checkout lane. She's always grabbing it, asking about it. Have to put it back. Um, so fighting with the conveyor belt there, as well as my daughter's hands. <laughs> Paid for our groceries with the uh, credit card reader. That's what we usually use there. Um, packing up the items in the car that we bought. And then going to Costco and doing it all over again. Because <laughs> my... Uh, Wife has very specific preferences on what you buy at Costco versus what you buy at Wegmans. So we've got to really just hit the right stores with the right ingredients. So doing it all over again. All right. Thanks, John. That was great. Um, so that was, yeah, round of applause. So that was step number three. Um, you can tell that, you know, some of the things that, that John walked us through may have been pretty high level, right? Um, it's up to us as the researchers and the facilitators to decide how specific a task needs to be, right? So if you do need a task to be more specific, it's, it's very similar to, you know, your typical research interview, what you would do in one of those, right? Asking open-ended follow-up questions. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you did that? Um, can you go into more detail about that step? Uh, or just simple, like, what else? What else did you do? Because they'll probably be, you know, leaving steps out. So, um, this is generally a good thing to do as you follow up. Another tip here, remember, you're going to be doing this session with multiple people, not just John. Um, and as a result, inevitably, people are going to be writing a lot of the same things down on their sticky notes. They're going to be tempted, and I see this every time, to group those things together on the board. Now, we don't want to let them do that. We want to scrap those duplicates and take them off the board because you're going to need all the room you can get. These maps get very long, very big. All right, so that was step three. Step four is very similar to what we just did. Um, so step four is about ordering things again. Uh, and I'll explain what that means. Um, so essentially, the first time that we do this, right, I've, I've just asked John to put things in chronological order. But not everything always happens in a linear order. And John has already kind of given us a preview of that with this little arrows that he's drawn. Um, Things might happen on a cycle, or things might happen in a flexible or random order, right? They're not always going to happen in the same A, B, C, D steps. So step number four is about you know, figuring out those nuances. Now, I've always found that people have a much easier time figuring out these nuances once cards are on the board. If you ask them to do this up front, they get really confused, and it's, it's hard to do. So we've got stuff on the board already. Like I said, John has already started applying some of these things, but the idea here for step four is you put these symbols up somewhere in the room, you walk through them with your participants, and you just work with them to apply them to the, the notes that are already on the board. So that is step four. 
Uh, step five is relatively straightforward. And John, if you wouldn't mind just you know, writing, doing this as I, I speak it out. Um, step five is about phases. So uh, it's really simple. We just gotta demarcate each of these groups of sticky notes into phases across the user experience. So um, it, sometimes it's hard to know what constitutes a new phase. Generally, when one group of tasks is changing from, you know, the main goal changes from one thing to another, it's time to make a new phase. So in our example, right, um, John transitions from, you know, preparing for shopping to actually doing the shopping uh, right about here where he's, you know, done driving to Wegmans and now he's walking through the aisles in order. So that would be a new phase. So he's gonna write those out while I keep going. Um, so that was step five. Step six, uh, we'll see this throughout the entire session. Uh, every time we finish a row, we're gonna wanna go back and review that with our participants. The point here is really just to make sure that nothing's missing. If something is missing, add, write that down on a card, add it back up into the map. Um, similarly, if something's unclear, make sure that we clarify it. And that's the great thing about post-it notes. They're so easy to pick up, move around, you can draw all over them, you can add new ones to the board. It's a work in progress. Okay, so uh, next we're gonna move on to the feeling row. So the doing row is, is more or less complete at this point, and that's great because everything from this point out kind of hinges off of the doing row. We're gonna reference back to that throughout the rest of the session. So, stepping back into my facilitator role. Um, okay, John, I would like for you to read back through the doing row from left to right silently to yourself. And as you're doing that, I'd like you to think about the way that you were feeling as you were completing those tasks. If you had a particular emotion, I'd like you to write it down on a card. So again, to make things super simple, we just have to fill in this blank. I felt blank because blank. Um, so. For an example, uh, let me change the slide here. When I went grocery shopping, I made a shopping list. But while I was doing that, I felt pretty frustrated because I couldn't remember the ingredients that I had at home already, uh, and I was making the list at work. So I wasn't sure what I needed to get. So any questions about that? Pretty clear? Nope? All right, great. So again, uh, two minute timer. I'm gonna start that if we do need more time. I am happy to add more time at the end, so take your time. All right, so while John does that, some more strategy talk. So, why individual groups or individual brainstorming instead of group brainstorming? For that, I'm gonna tell you another little cautionary tale. So, I did one of these sessions once with a group of real estate assistants, and there were three of them in the room. One of them was much more senior, and a little bit more outspoken than the other two. And I'm sure a lot of you may have experienced something similar to this. I asked them to walk me through the steps of listing a new listing on the internet. And the one senior assistant you know, speaks up immediately and tells me there's three steps to the process, no more, no less. And that would have been fine, except I knew there were a lot more than three steps because I had talked to a lot of other people. So I probed, I was like, you know, what else? But she's you know, stood her ground, three steps, no more, no less. Meanwhile, the other two assistants are just sitting in the room, they're not saying anything. It became very clear that they were not keen on challenging the senior assistant's, uh, you know, perspective of how many steps it took to, to list a listing. This is the challenge with group brainstorming. If someone is sort of the alpha in the group or they're charismatic, they can easily take over the conversation. Um, and this is no secret, right? So I'm not saying that you should never do group brainstorming. I'm saying that you know, it can be very fruitful. You just need to be a great facilitator to be able to do it. And I'm, you know, I wouldn't even say, I'm not a great facilitator. I can't, I don't do it. I do individual brainstorming because it's a much easier way to get into the game and still get valid data without running the risk of someone taking over the conversation. The other benefit of individual uh, brainstorming, we talked about how hard it is to get everyone in the same room to do one of these sessions. With individual brainstorming, you don't need to just have one session. You can have multiple sessions, right? And that's my timer, we'll come back to that in a second. 
So, um, you know, you can have one session with Tom on Monday, another session with Trudy on Tuesday, and you still get the same data out of it. Lastly, we've talked about how um, we want to be doing this session with end users, but we haven't talked about which end users. So who you invite to the session is very much going to depend on the lens of your map or the perspective of your map. So let's say, for example, that you're doing the session uh, for you know, an aggregate of all of your personas. So you're going to need to invite people, you know, two or three people from each persona to get that full coverage. Now, a word of caution there, you generally want these sessions to only have between six and eight people. So if you've got a lot of personas, you might need to have more than one session. Okay, and we talked about we're doing this with end users. We can't forget about the people in our organization though. The point of experience mapping is not to create a deliverable. It's about collaboration. If you create a deliverable and no one was involved with it, it's just gonna end up sitting in a drawer somewhere or up on a wall, no one's ever gonna read it. The whole point of this is to build empathy. So I recommend getting your teammates involved, having them come to the session with you to observe, or if possible, um, have them actually help you facilitate it as well. That's even better. Okay, so John, um, looks like you're done writing over here. Indeed I am. Okay, so for the next step, facilitator hat back on, we're gonna talk about the feeling row. So I would like for you to uh, read each of your feeling cards out loud. Um, as you read them out loud, I'd like you to place them on the board beneath the task that sparked that emotion for you. And it looks like you're a step ahead of me. Um, and you probably noticed I've drawn a scale over here on the left from negative two to two. So if the uh, emotion that you felt was particularly negative, I'd like you to place it at the bottom of the scale. If it was particularly positive, I'd like you to put it at the top of the scale. Make sense? Sure. Uh, so when I uh, had to backtrack to the deli, I mentioned that we had forgotten to pick up some uh, something from the deli. Um, that was a pretty negative kind of feeling, so I would put that at a negative one here. And what was the, like, can you read the card out loud? Uh, when I backtracked, I felt annoyed because the deli was one of the first areas that I had passed. Second one, uh, when wandering around looking for the ranch dip packet, I felt frustrated because I, waited I wasted 15 minutes searching for one ingredient and I couldn't find anybody around to help me. So that was very frustrating. Put that at a negative two. When checking out, I felt rushed because there's a long line behind me, and as I said, I had to argue with my daughter, put the candy back in the cart, and fight that battle at the same time. So that was maybe a negative one. And when paying for our stuff, I felt good because I had saved $10. Huge win. So I'm gonna put that at a plus two. Thanks, John. So coming back over here. Okay, um, this was an example that uh, I forgot to go through. So again, third step of, of the feeling row, we're basically done with the feeling row now. Um, but again, at, each, at the end of each row, we're gonna wanna review with our participants, make sure nothing's missing, add, add additional things. So moving on to the thinking row. Um, again, guess how we're gonna do it? Individual brainstorming, fill in the blanks. So uh, John, coming back over to you. Now what I'd like you to do is again, read back through the doing row, left to right, silently to yourself. As you read through, I'd like you to write down any thoughts that you had while completing those tasks. So uh, again, the fill in the blank example would be, you know, as I was completing this task, I thought blank, right? So as an example, um, when I was making my shopping list, I was thinking about how I wanted to make guacamole because it's really yummy. Um, but I wasn't sure if the avocados that I bought a few weeks ago were still good or not at home. So that was one thought that I had. Any questions? All right. So I'm going to start the timer again. Two minutes. Start. So again, while John's brainstorming, some more wisdom. So super important to know your space before you go. Um, and I, I found this out, you know, when we 
set up for this session. I was going back and forth with Eric here to figure out, you know, how much space do we have? Can we get a big whiteboard? No, okay. Well, do we have a big flat surface? That's really mostly what you need to do one of these sessions, a big flat surface. Whiteboards are great because you can scrawl all over the margins, write whatever you want on it. Um, but if you can't get a hold of a whiteboard, flat walls are great, tables are great generally frowned upon to write upon those things. So that's why we brought these big white uh, easel post-it notes. Those cost like 25 bucks at Staples again. Um, so uh, definitely, you know, bring backups, be prepared, know your space before you go. Uh, and that the listing assistants that I did the session with before, I did that on their turf. One mistake that I made was I like, didn't know anything about the space before I went and they were not super excited about the idea of me plastering their walls with a bunch of post-it notes. So we had to go digital and that made everything less smooth. Speaking of digital, um, again, we've talked about how hard it is to get everyone in the same room. It might be a lot easier if they don't all have to be in the same room to do this session. So you can do these sessions remotely. It's a little tricky, but you can definitely do it. I've done it before. So what you're gonna need if you wanna do this remotely is an online whiteboarding tool. Now these tools are really coming to their own of late. They're not all janky and weird like they used to be. Um, if you want some recommendations, definitely find me after and I can give you some. But a key thing with the whiteboarding tools is to uh, make sure everyone is signed up ahead of the session or as many people as possible because people will inevitably forget and not sign up. So you're gonna, you're gonna wanna schedule an additional like five or 10 minutes to let people sign up ahead of time. That's my timer. Um, the other thing, try not to have some people co-located and some people remote. If one person's gonna be remote, they should all be remote because the remote people, regardless of how good a facilitator you are, they're gonna have a lot of trouble getting a word in. Um, and like if you're co-located and you're doing something like this, they can't see what's up on the board, right? Okay, so back over to John. So John, very similar to what we did before, I'd like you to read each of your thinking cards out loud. And as you read them out loud, I'd like you to place them on the map beneath the task that sparked that thought for you. All right, so when I realized that we needed to shop, I thought, oh great, another trip to that grocery store. When making the list, I was thinking, I hope I didn't forget anything. When walking through the aisles, I thought, which items from my list are in this aisle? You know, did I, am I missing something or am I gonna, which, which items do I need to be looking at on my list? When wandering around lost, I thought, even if there was an employee here, I'd rather find this on my own. When checking out, I thought, they put this candy here on purpose, just to stress me out. And when driving to the second store, I thought, oh great another trip to the grocery store. All right, thanks, John. So, what do we have next? Um, again, review the row with your participants. So we're almost done here. Next, we have the opportunities row down here at the bottom. So you might be asking yourself, like, what the heck is an opportunity? It's kind of this vague term. The best way to explain it is, we have these pain points that we've written up on the board now in the feeling row. An opportunity is going to be an idea to solve that pain point for your end users. So, um, we're gonna facilitate this a little bit differently than how we facilitated the rest of the rows, right? Before we were reading back through the doing row and kind of brainstorming things based off of that. Here, we're gonna pick one pain point and brainstorm a bunch of different solutions for that one pain point. So how do we choose which pain point? Well, it's pretty simple. We have everything kind of ranked here by how sucky that experience was for John. So for us, you know, the worst thing is gonna be this negative two here where he was kind of wandering around looking for this ranch dip, pack, uh, ranch dip packet that he could not find. So um, 
back to John. So John, I'd like for you to um, think about if you had a magic wand, how would you make the experience of you know finding this ranch dip packet and shopping in the store uh, less painful? I'd like you to write each idea down on a separate post-it note. Um, so again, we'll walk through an example. So that's the wrong slide. If um, earlier we talked about how I made a shopping list, right? And it was painful for me because I couldn't remember what I had at home. I wanted to make guac, couldn't remember if the avocados were good. So an idea here might be if I had some app or some tool that kind of tracked what I had bought in the past and then generally knew how long different produce items last so that it would be able to tell me like those avocados you bought two weeks ago are probably not good anymore. You should buy some new ones. So make sense? Yep. All right. Again, two minutes on the clock. You know the drill. If you need more time, we can always give you more time. So while John's doing that, one more friendly PSA. So opportunities. Nielsen and Norman did a uh, survey, I think, of 48 different user experience professionals, and they found that 75% of people who do experience maps completely skip the opportunities row altogether. Even worse, 92% of them didn't assign the ideas that came out to anyone on the team. This is one of the biggest mistakes you can make if you do an experience mapping session. If you don't hold anyone accountable to uh, actually solve these problems, or if you don't brainstorm ways to solve the problems, again, this just becomes a deliverable with a bunch of problems on it that never actually leads to change within your organization or within your experience. So tip number one, don't skip opportunities. Tip number two, invite the right people. We've talked about this before, but who you invite to this session will very much depend on the culture at your organization. So. Some organizations don't feel comfortable asking their end users to come up with ideas to solve pain points or to innovate. They either feel like they're asking their customers to do too much or they're not so sure about the, uh, you know, the quality of the ideas that they're going to get out of the session. If this sounds like your organization, um, you, know, you can always end the session with end users at the thinking row and then schedule a separate session with your internal team to do the opportunities row. Now, if you, like me, believe that your end users are a great source of ideas, then by all means, include them in this part of the workshop. So we talked about this. All right, so now we're going to go back to John, facilitator hat back on. All right, John, so I would like for you to uh, read through each of your ideas. Um, oh, let me turn that off. And uh, for each idea, I'd like you to put it underneath the pain point that it solves, which is obvious. It's the one that we talked about before. And so at this stage, um, it's important to remind people not to pass judgment. We are sort of going to do that here in the next step, but it's just about deferring that uh, until later. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, so to prevent kind of wandering around, um, wasting time, looking for something. Uh, the ideas that I came up with are having more signage, better signage that has more ingredients or examples listed at the ends of the aisles. Um, possibly, you know, the store could provide a map actually on my shopping cart, like maybe in the seat or something, so that I could get a map of the store, again, maybe with some examples of what's found in each aisle. Uh, or there could be some kind of a tool or an app or something that shows me um, from my list what's the fastest route to get through the store so that I don't you know, miss things or I don't misunderstand where things are. All right, thanks, John. So I'm going to put these up here, and I'm going to explain what they mean here in just a second. Next to each idea. I'll kind of stagger them. All right, so it's tempting to just throw a bunch of ideas up on the board, call it a day. But remember, we want these ideas to be grounded in reality so that people actually take action on them. So a great way to do this is to talk about impact versus effort. It's a pretty tried and true facilitation technique that many of you may have used. Um, 
Now, to talk about impact, John, what I'd, I'd like for you to do is uh, read through each one of these ideas again and think about how positively each idea would impact grocery store shoppers. And you can see that I've added a scale next to each idea for impact that ranges from low to high. And there's also a not sure on there. I'd like you to mark a tally on that scale for each idea based on how impactful you think the idea will be. If you're not sure, you know, if you feel like you don't know enough, feel free to mark that not sure um, line there. So while John's doing that, um, why scales? So again, we talked about earlier how there can be some alphas in the group um, that can definitely skew your results here. They can try to rally people behind their idea. The scales mitigates this to a certain extent. Um, not completely, I mean, I guess you could always follow the charismatic person around the room and just vote for whatever they voted for, but it, it makes it a lot harder to do that. Now, if you're super concerned about your group and kind of their dynamic, what you can do, or I guess what you could do, is some sort of like survivor voting where you kick everyone out of the room, people go in one at a time, you put like a shoebox beneath each idea and they, they put their votes in. Um, full disclosure, I've never actually done this, but I think it could work. So, um, it looks like John has done this. I, I'm not gonna go through uh, where he put his votes, again, because we're, we're strapped for time today, but the whole point of doing this is to identify disagreements amongst people in the group, um, like here, right? Like we have some people who voted for high impact, some people who voted for low impact. The point here is not necessarily to come to consensus with your group, it's just about gathering more data from the participants so you can kind of think about their, th see their thought process behind why one idea might be better than another idea. Okay, effort, we talked about effort. You can do this same thing for effort with the scales. The scales work great for this as well. Now, the one thing with effort is we're constantly thinking about inviting the right people. 99% of the time, the people who will be able to estimate the level of effort for uh, one of these ideas is not going to be your end users. You're gonna want your internal people in this session. So what I recommend is you have a session with your end users to talk about impact, schedule a separate session with your internal team, again, to talk about impact and effort. And with effort, it's, it's you know, don't get super granular with it. We're not looking for man hours here or woman hours, um, we're looking for, you know, sometimes we use like t-shirt sizes, small, medium, large, extra large, because at this point, ideas are gonna be super vague, high level. So once you've done that, you can kind of visualize everything on an uh, effort versus impact matrix. So you're looking for ideas that are low effort, high value, or high effort, high value. Um, Generally, you'll hear those referred to as quick wins or sort of long-term strategy plays. Anything that's not a quick win or a long-term play, feel free to just take it off the board. Um, it's basically a non-starter. And again, we talked about this before, but my last piece of advice to you, assign ownership to each one of these ideas before you leave the room. That's not saying that they have to go and like do the idea today, it's just like, you're responsible for fleshing this idea out more. Because again, they're gonna be very vague ideas at this point. And remember, we only did that for one pain point, right? We're gonna go back, look at the next worst pain point and repeat this process for that as time permits. So, um, this is pretty awesome, right? We've got the beginnings of an experience map. It would be a lot more full if you did do this with you know, more than one person and if you had more than 45 minutes. Um, so I uh, definitely want to thank John for, you know, standing up here in his, well, sitting in his walking boot. He, he's a trooper. I um, want to thank all of you for listening to me. Uh, we do have some free goodies for you all. Uh, I think somewhere outside on a chair, we have some experience mapping cards that we've printed out. Um, we only have 50 of those. So if you're not able to get your hands on them, I think there's definitely more than 50 people here. Uh, you can download them for free on our website moduscreate.com slash UX Burlington. Print them out, print and play, it's like six pages. You can do it black and white, it'll be super useful. Uh, we also have a free slide deck that you can download that will help you facilitate one of these sessions. Um, and with that, voila, we have an experience map.